Washington, though, really believed that as the days and months and years passed, the American hand would be strengthened and the British would go weaker. Washington understood that the presence of British soldiers on American soil just inherently worked to their disadvantage. And of course, the way that British soldiers acted, the way that they treated the American civilian population certainly made them no friends. When Washington dealt with civilians, if he, if he absolutely had to confiscate um, animals, he would write a receipt. If he had to, to stop and encamp on somebody's land, he would ask permission. He did his very, very best to minimize the negative impact that his army had on the local civilian population, wherever he happened to be, to respect the rights, including the property rights, of uh, civilian Americans. And, and we should remember, too, that this is not only a war between nations, this is not only a war for empire, this is, in many respects, a civil war. Adams, back in 1776, estimated that you could divide the American people into thirds. A third were in favor of independence, a third were loyalists, they wanted to remain part of Great Britain. And a third were people who sat on the fence. They were uh, people who might change their stated affiliation depending upon the circumstances, depending upon the environment. Some of you might remember or be familiar with uh, the first Austin Powers movie. Austin Powers, of course, in 1967 is, uh, is, is frozen and put in suspended animation. And 30 years later, he's brought back, he's, he's reanimated. And uh, if 1967, we had been at the height of the Cold War and he had been fighting various baddies, including the communists, um, in 1997, things had, had changed remarkably. And so as he is sort of dethawed at British intelligence headquarters, um, his main contact, a man named Nigel, um, as he comes through, Nigel is flanked by two other men. One, an American general. Okay. The other, a Russian general. And Austin Powers, shocked that a Russian general would be in British intelligence headquarters, thinking that 30 years after his, his uh, you know, entrance into suspended animation, that the Soviets had somehow won the Cold War, Austin's first thought was to try to make nice to the Russian general. He looked at him and he said, hey, comrade, those capitalist pigs will pay for their crimes. <laughs> and Nigel leaned forward and he said, Austin, we won. And then immediately Austin turned to the American general and he said, yay, capitalism. <laughs> A lot of Americans were like that during the course of the war. The British army would enter their city or enter their town and they would pretend to, uh, you know, whistle the tune of God Save the King. As soon as the British Army left, especially after the British Army left, especially after the British Army left in its wake, all sorts of destruction, all sorts of, of mistreatment, horrible mistreatment of the civilian population, especially perhaps the female civilian population, they would start singing the praises not of George III, but of George Washington. Uh, a prime example is uh, an event that occurred in 1777 under the, uh, the direction of General John Burgoyne. One of the first strategies that the British possessed was to try to use the Hudson River to separate New England from the rest of the colonies. They thought that the contagion of revolution had begun there and you could sort of amputate New England from the rest of the colonies, isolate New England, and this contagion of liberty would not spread. They did just about everything within their power to secure the Hudson River. And they even, they even worked with Native American tribes and offered to Native American tribes payment for the scalps of patriots. Of course, the Native Americans somehow had difficulty identifying 
which scalps were patriotic and which scalps were loyalists. And they figured that the British would have the same sort of difficulty. So rather indiscriminately, Native Americans wreaked havoc upon the local populations. And really, no one was safe. There was a young woman named Jane McRae who was engaged uh, to a young loyalist who was fighting alongside the British Army. He was a lieutenant, and he was there as the uh, Native American was pulling out of his bag all of the scalps of the supposed patriots. He was counting out the money piece by piece. Perhaps he was thinking about his beautiful loyalist fiance, the beautiful Jane McRae, known for her distinctive long flowing red locks, went into the bag, reached the Indian, and pulled out the scalp that could only belong to the now butchered, now departed loyalist woman, Jane McRae. This is a story that we know because it was told by both sides during the war. It was told by the American side, of course, because the message was clear. It didn't really matter if you were a loyalist or a patriot. The British were willing to do all sorts of things to establish power and domination in America. As late as 1780, Washington was imploring people to repel an enemy from your borders, who not content with hiring mercenaries to lay waste your country, and here he's referring to the, to the Hessians, have now bought savages with the avowed and expressed intention of adding murder to desolation. So as time passed, John Adams's initial estimation that the population could be divided into thirds began to change. And there were fewer and fewer loyalists. And there were fewer and fewer people on the fence. And more and more people identified and supported the cause of independence. In other words, the British were terrible at winning hearts and minds. And they also made some military mistakes. After they gave up on their strategy to secure um, the North by taking over the Hudson River, they turned their attention to the South. And after an initial series of victories, the British began to stumble. And they did something that uh, at West Point, I always tell cadets not to do. Now, note that I'm a civilian. I have no military experience. I rarely uh, think it's appropriate for me to give military advice. But in this instance, I think the advice is sound. Uh, if only Lord Cornwallis had, had taken it, perhaps the war wouldn't have ended when it did. Here's the advice. Don't retreat to a peninsula. <laughs> it's a bad move. It's a bad move, especially if George Washington gets wind of it. And Washington and his French counterpart, General Rochambeau, marched all the way from the outskirts of New York City. Under the cover of darkness, they left the campfires burning so that the, the, the British who were watching them, who were spying on them, would think that they were still encamped there. They, they marched all the way down toward Yorktown. Meanwhile, they got word to the French fleet under Admiral de Gras. He was able to arrive at the Chesapeake Bay to close off uh, the British forces' avenue of retreat by water while Washington and Rochambeau were able to surround them by land. And finally, the British Army surrendered. And if the 1781 Battle of Yorktown is oftentimes thought of as the fighting end of the war, the last major battle, the Treaty of Peace had still not yet been signed. And there was another, perhaps even more consequential battle that remained to be fought. Washington took his army and he relocated it back to the Hudson River Valley, still strategically important, with the British occupying New York City, with the British, of course, possessing Canada. He moved his army up there, and they encamped in what is now New Windsor, New York. 
just outside of Newburgh. And armies do what armies oftentimes do when they're not engaged in fighting or when they're not engaged in rigorous training. This army was engaged in complaining. The officers especially were complaining about what would happen to them after the war. Various state governments, the Continental Congress had made different promises about pay and benefits. Many of them wanted half pay for life. They had little hope, however, that after the war ended, the Continental Congress would actually um, honor their request, that it would make good on the debt that they believed was owed to them. As soon as the peace treaty was signed, they knew the army would probably be dissolved. And many began to have some really dangerous thoughts. There was a lieutenant colonel named Louis Nicola who actually wrote a letter to George Washington saying, you should become the king. You should establish yourself as George I of America. We need your leadership. We need a strong leader like you. And Washington, when he received this letter, he tore it up, he threw it down. He said that it filled him with the utmost horror. The notion that he would become the same sort of leader, the same sort of ruler that we had been fighting against. It was the exact opposite purpose of our revolution. It was a war not only for independence from Great Britain, it was a war for independence from tyranny, and he would have no part of it. And so you can imagine how, how dispirited Washington was when he heard another rumor, this one a very serious one, that some of his senior officers were plotting a possible rebellion, that there at Newburgh they were engaged in a conspiracy to perhaps march the army into the West and leave the United States undefended, thereby removing much leverage that it had at the bargaining table in Paris where treaty, the Treaty of Peace was being negotiated. Others thought about marching the army to Philadelphia, guns loaded, demanding that the Continental Congress agree to their demands. When Washington heard this, he called his men together. He went inside this kind of rough log meeting house, and he stood before them. He uh, pulled the notes out of his pocket. He squinted down. He began to read. He, he implored his officers to look with utmost horror and detestation on anyone who wishes, under any specious pretenses, to overturn the liberties of your country. Then he squinted a bit more. He reached into his pocket. He pulled out something that uh, they had never seen Washington in possession of before. No one except his closest advisors, his closest aides. Washington put on a pair of, of spectacles, a pair of glasses. Back then, uh, seen as a, a real sign of old age and infirmity. In other words, it was, it was a pathetic sight. And Washington said, gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have grown not only gray, but almost blind in your service. And at that moment, according to all the people who were there and later wrote about it, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. These grown men who had seen so much bloodshed began to openly weep because they realized that they were about to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. They realized how petty they were. Sure, some had engaged in great battles. Some had made great sacrifices. Some could not be among them because they had made the ultimate sacrifice. But here was George Washington. Here was George Washington who had been with this fight almost since the very beginning. Here was George Washington who had more to lose than anyone else. Here was George Washington, a man who refused to take any pay whatsoever during the course of the war. Here was George Washington, who had endured every hardship, who had exposed himself to every danger, 
Here was George Washington, a man literally with bullet holes in his coat. He was so big, and it made them feel so small. And that one moment and that simple gesture, to whatever degree the Newburgh conspiracy was a viable and serious threat, there it dissipated, there it vanished. Washington, in other words, saved the revolution from going down the path that many other revolutions had gone, and many other revolutions would go. Washington was no Cromwell. Washington was no Napoleon. Washington was an original. Washington, after the Treaty of Paris was signed, proceeded down to Annapolis, where the Continental Congress had convened, and he tendered his resignation. He said to the assembled body, having now finished the work assigned me, I retire from the great theater of action in bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body under whose orders I have so long acted, I here offer my commission and take leave of all the employments of public life. And then there, in an instant, General Washington was a civilian once more. And this was an action that was almost unprecedented, almost. During most of the war, when people compared George Washington to a historical figure, they compared him to Moses, right? Moses, who led his people from slavery to freedom. But now, Americans began to compare George Washington to Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus. Cincinnatus, the fifth century BC Roman who fought for the Republic. He, uh, he left his farm. He picked up the sword, he went and fought, he went and secured victory, and then he did the unthinkable. He gave up power. He traded his sword for his plow once more. He's kind of like the, the character Maximus in the movie Gladiator. You know, Russell Crowe in the opening scenes of that film, they're getting ready to, to fight a big battle um, against these, uh, these barbaric looking uh, Europeans. And He's not thinking about the fight. He's not thinking about the battle. Where is his mind? His mind is back home. The opening scenes keep cutting to this image of him walking through his wheat field, dreaming about going back to his family, back to his farm, back to his books, to sit under his vine and his fig tree. That's what Cincinnatus did. That's what George Washington does. George III had been told that Washington might do this, that Washington might indeed resign his commission when the war came to a conclusion, that he might give up power after having secured liberty. And George III couldn't believe it. According to the story, he scoffed, he laughed. He said, if he does that, if George Washington does that, then truly he is the world's greatest man. And that's what George Washington did. And that's what George Washington was. Thank you very much.